Hi, everyone, and welcome to week four, where we introduce the field of conflict prevention as a theoretical lens. As usual, we have our learning objectives. Okay, let's start with the keyword conflict, which is already a pretty broad concept. It's broader than genocide or even war. But even within the already broad concept of conflict, there's a narrow construal that focuses on the inherently violent nature of a struggle, whereas the broader meaning of conflict is more in terms of a dispute, as a decidedly non-violent alternative. And so in that latter sense, conflict isn't necessarily bad. Like, we're not ever going to entirely eradicate conflict, nor should we want to. Really what we want to prevent is the escalation of conflict, avoiding triggers or turning points that enable situations to slip from unstable peace to crisis to war or worse. You see here a popular conception of conflict, measured by degrees or scales of escalation and de-escalation along the vertical axis, and time, as in the duration of conflict, along the horizontal axis. As you can see on this graph as well, there are multiple points of intervention across different stages of a conflict. Conflict prevention, per se, is only possible early on. Recall the upstream perspective from week one, which involves dealing with risk factors before it's too late. Once a situation reaches a tipping point, it's too late for prevention. It becomes a matter of management and resolution. That's the midstream level of analysis. And the downstream perspective involves conflict transformation, post-conflict peace building. So reading one starts by discussing the changing nature of global security in the post-Cold War era. Traditionally, wars were fought between two or more sovereign states. That's what is referred to as interstate warfare, as distinct from intrastate warfare, the latter of which takes place within the borders of a sovereign state. Now, this includes civil wars, but other forms of conflict as well. Although intrastate wars have been on the rise since the 1960s, there was a sharp surge with the end of the Cold War, peaking in 1992, as demonstrated in the graph on the left. Now just look at the solid line, referring to the number of ongoing civil wars per year from 1945 to 2014. This was said to be an era of quote-unquote new wars, whereas so-called old wars were fought by regular armed forces of states in the name of political interest and or ideology, New wars are said to be fought by varying combinations of regular and irregular forces, often in the name of identity. Ethnicity is thus assumed to be a crucial driver of conflict. Here's a tentative definition of ethnicity from reading one. This is based on a theory of social constructivism, which assumes that ethnic groups are artificially distinguished from one another through intersubjective systems of meaning and symbolism. Ethnic groups aren't primordial entities that are somehow fixed, natural, and ancient, even if they imagine themselves as such. Ethnicity is less a thing, per se, and more of a process, a verb rather than a noun. Hence, the less colloquial but technically more nuanced term, ethnification. So, rather than take for granted the pre-existence of competing ethnic groups, we should rather understand how such differences are constructed through conflict. Indeed, the very assumption that ethnicity is the key driver of new wars inadvertently gives force to the constructedness of social identity. That whatever theory we use to understand ethnic conflict, what's crucial in terms of a warning sign is when such identity-based conflicts are cast in existential terms. As the authors of Reading One state on page 5, this produces a sort of kill-or-be-killed logic that requires and even justifies war against both immediate and future threats. In such a radicalized ideological setting, it makes sense for perpetrators to kill children, for example. I mean, why let them grow up and seek revenge? And that's the insidious logic to be on the lookout for. Okay, so what's all this got to do with education? As the nature of global conflict changed in the 1990s, so too was there a rethinking of its possible causes and solutions, including the role of education. All of our readings challenge the common liberal assumption, for example, that education is necessarily a force for good, or the concomitant belief that conflict is caused by a lack of education. They also challenge the role of education in nation building. This is especially evident in this bit here from reading one, but even in readings two and three, we see how formal education systems promote hegemonic narratives that reproduce structures of power, oppression, and privilege, while also opposing reconciliatory ideas and practices. For example, we see here an archival photograph of an Indian residential school in North America, to which the authors briefly allude on page 6. We talked about this a bit in week 1, with the whole kill the Indian, save the man logic that was epitomized by the founder of the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Pennsylvania, 
I showed a picture that week of the cemetery there as a more visceral reminder of the presence of genocide, at a school no less. The authors of Reading One are thus reminding us that education is no panacea, and that rather than acting as a stabilizing force for peace, formal education systems can actually reproduce and even exacerbate conflicts. Speaking of the two faces in the title of Reading One, if the positive face of education is constructive in terms of promoting peace, then the negative face of education is socially destructive, not just in terms of destroying others, but more generally in terms of destroying the very ideas of coexistence and reconciliation. Okay, so let's get more specific. How can education have a socially destructive impact? For one thing, schools are a site of social exclusion. The uneven distribution of education as a social good involves discriminatory policies and practices that restrict access to educational opportunities based on identity. This was most stark in apartheid South Africa, the contemporary legacies of which are seen here in this picture on the top left. You can also look at the reverberations of Jim Crow America, where the separate but equal doctrine may have been rejected, but U.S. schools remain highly segregated. Formal education can also be a weapon in cultural repression, or what the authors of Reading One identify as ethnocide. As we saw with the picture of the Indian residential schools in the previous slide, Formal education can be used to efface or erase distinct identities as a byproduct from the mass production of a homogenized citizenry. Denial of education is a weapon of war. I mean, we're seeing that right now in Ukraine, where the deliberate destruction of schools is used as a means to erode civilian support. Manipulating history for political purposes is yet another weapon in conflict within states and societies. This was, or perhaps even still is, in the case of North Korea, most manifest in totalitarian societies of the mid-20th century. Okay, so let's turn to reading two, which comes from the rich literature on the Rwandan genocide. This reading is actually broken up into a series of files according to chapter. This slide is especially concerned with chapter one, which is more of a theoretical reflection on the two faces of education, i.e. how education can both lead to and away from conflict. Some of this repeats what we've already said, albeit in more theoretical terms, perhaps. So we can measure the relationship between education and conflict along two analytical axes, or dimensions. The psychocultural dimension is about how identity-based differences are perceived or performed, as the author of Reading 2 reminds us that schooling is not always just a passive reflector of existing social conditions, but also an active amplifier of social categories and messages. Socio-cultural factors essentially concerns who has access to schools and how classrooms are set up. Notably, these dimensions work in both directions. They can either promote conflict or promote peace, although the author includes the caveat that distinct factors may be pulling in opposite directions. Anyways, here are the theoretical terms that the author uses to analyze how schooling can promote conflict. For example, material inequalities between groups can lead to collective grievances that may, in turn, lead to conflict. This also works on a more symbolic level as well. Although the author doesn't use the term microaggressions, I think that's essentially what she means by talking about how classrooms may reflect or create a permissive environment for conflict. Exclusive identities refers to the crystallization of identity-based differences. Crystallization is how identities, which are necessarily fluid, dynamic, and open to change, become hardened, reified, and assumed to be fixed, stable, and constant. This is how the dichotomization of society, according to an us-versus-them mentality, becomes cemented, which in turn can lead to other forms of stigmatization that are rooted in notions of supremacy, and which often lead to various forms of dehumanization. Yet these same factors can pull in the opposite direction as well. So, how does education promote peace? Well, in order to correct unequal access to schooling, we should be trying to achieve a more equitable distribution of goods and opportunities. Rather than crystallizing differences, we can foster new, more inclusive identities that supersede and recategorize old divisions by embracing rather than rejecting differences. Now, this can all hopefully lead to peace and reconciliation. Okay, so that's all well and good in theory, but how does this all work in practice? Reading 3 looks at the everyday challenges of teaching children from conflicting groups. The authors are looking at societies that are presently stuck in intractable conflicts, which, among other things, require substantial affective investment in maintaining a certain ethos of conflict. Collective memory serves an important role in linking identity with conflict. And this is perpetuated through the hegemonic reproduction of dominant historical narratives, 
Hegemony is a key word from cultural theory that refers to how dominant power structures exert power tacitly through intellectual, moral, and ideological influences. So how does this work in actual classrooms? The authors of Reading 3 each drew from their extensive experiences conducting ethnographic research and observing classroom environments. In Israel, they looked at bilingual integrated schools for Palestinian and Jewish children. In particular, they looked at schools associated with an NGO that was originally created by a Palestinian and American Jew called the Center for Bilingual Education in Israel, now known as Hand in Hand. Notably, classrooms at these schools have two teachers, one Palestinian, the other Jewish. In Cyprus, they looked at some of the few Greek Cypriot schools that have some Turkish Cypriot children whose families either stayed south after the War of 1974 or moved there more recently. So the chapter we're looking at highlights the failures of these schools to achieve their desired results. The authors identified two common problems. The first was that the schools and teachers apparently couldn't resist highlighting collective narratives whenever the opportunity presented itself. Although students apparently have individual stories to tell, even when they rarely get a chance to share those stories, the authors note that the teachers retreat the collective narratives. Secondly, the teachers deflect any information or perspectives that challenge this hegemonic account by making an argument about the children's supposed developmental needs, i.e. the retort that students are, quote, not ready to understand the complexities of intractable conflicts. So maybe we can discuss in greater detail how these facets played out in the two classroom events described by the authors. Okay, and that's it. As usual, we have our discussion forum post. Also, reach out to me if you want to discuss your final project. Anyways, thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time.